Ôi trời ơi C.W. Mayberry, Tour of the Apostolics in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This message is being pre-recorded as we will be out of town um, as you're watching this. Um, let us do as we typically do and begin with prayer. In the name of Yeshua, I pray, great and mighty God, that you would touch this people wherever they are. Those that we are familiar with, those that we do not know, anyone who will watch this recording, I pray God move through, through it in on their behalf, move through it and touch lives, move through it and minister. In the name of Yeshua, touch the hearts and the minds of everyone gathering. God, you already know the circumstances and the situations and the lives of the people that are going to be watching this. You're already aware of what conditions they are living in, even now. I pray the mercy of, of your grace upon them, even now, in the name of Yeshua. Touch every heartache, touch every struggle, touch every difficulty, touch every question, God, that comes to the mind. Move in them, move on them, God. Draw them closer to you by the virtue of the shed blood and the broken body. As you provided for our sins, move on and draw them nigh unto yourself. Minister, Lord God, as if this were alive. Let's see, even now, I've seen you do it. I know you can do it. I have no doubt that you will. Lord God, every situation broke presented, you're aware of. In the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen and amen. And friend, I trust uh, that you're a believer. I trust that you're seeking after God. I trust that you are endeavoring to go further in your pursuit, knowledge, and understanding of all things having to do with our great and benevolent creator. Um, he is available for you 24-7. If we can help you in any way, we're willing to do that, uh, wanting to do that. But the great God that rules over all things is available at all times across every time zone, in any situation, if you'll simply begin to cry out to him in sincerity, I assure you, he will answer. We're going to title, uh, well, first of all, we're going to get back to our study in Daniel chapter 9 next week, not left off that. I simply didn't want to record that and put it on here and uh, have people have to go back to it. So we'll pick that up um, next Sabbath. But the subject matter today is something that has always struck me um, as being something people didn't really look into, obviously because I hadn't, not to the degree uh, that I have begun to. And sometimes it's just a phrase that appears uh, again and again, sometimes in different forms that we really don't pay much attention to it. Uh, and it has to do, you know, with the use of the word name n-a-m-e we're going to title this what's in a name and i'm going to read through it's just some verses in chronolo chronological order and this may seem a bit disjointed to you as we begin to go through it um but stick with me stick with the subject matter and you'll see it's not really disjointed at all um it's our 
anglicized understanding of the word of God that oftentimes uh, inadvertently uh, fail things. And it's my job and your job to go deeper than the surface and, and to turn these things over and, and, and to find what is there. I'm beginning with Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. And given, given that I'm doing this uh, as a recording, I'm not going to allow time for people to uh, turn the pages to get there. Um, you want to keep notes, keep notes, go back and visit these things. That would be uh, to your benefit. But Matthew 1 and 21, this is the scene in which the angel comes um, declaring the name of Yeshua uh, to uh, Mary. And it reads, and she shall bring forth a son, or to Joseph, I'm sorry, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. That doesn't make a lot of sense in English, but when you um, consider the idea that many believe the book of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew, it, it, it takes on a new light. Let me explain. It says, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. His name is Yeshua. Yeshua literally means salvation. For he shall save his people from their sins. This is a Hebrewism. This is a form um, of, of uh, well, how do you put that? It is, it is a form of speech unique to the Hebrew language. It actually reads, his name shall be called Yeshua, or he shall Yoshia, his people, Yeshua, Yoshia. He shall salvation, he shall call his name salvation, or he shall save his people, All right? And you find other instances of that in the book of Matthew. But the point is, what's in a name? There were many male children in Israel being born that carried the name of Yeshua. Moses' general, who we call Joshua, was properly named Yeshua. It, and, a, and a male child, especially the sports, firstborn, would have been named that because there was always a looking forward for a deliverer. And at different times in the history of Israel, uh, that became more important than others, particularly when they were subjugated in bondage being ruled over by a foreign nation all right then matthew 7 and 22 many will say to me in that day this is yeshua speaking lord lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and i will profess unto them i never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity the word for iniquity is anonomia it means lawlessness or torah lessness these people were operating using the name of yeshua i'm 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 not even going to contend that they didn't have legitimate right to do so but to have the right to do so legitimately does not mean you maintain that right you've got to maintain your integrity to whatever the code is that you have um, prescribed or have been prescribed if you no longer do those things um you have no right any longer even though you continue to operate israel was given the torah the law and often failed and drifted from it and was punished for it it is possible to call the name of yeshua or jesus over people having left off the things that he taught as being absolutely uh, essential to that relationship. That's where these people are. They are utilizing the proper name, but they're not doing so in a prescribed manner. They're not living it. They're not in unity with it. Okay. And then Matthew chapter 10 and 22. And he shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. It's not the J-E-S-U-S. -S. It's not the letters of, of, of the name Yeshua. It's the renown. It's what it stands for. It's what it, what it encapsulates. Um, that, that 
that broken body, that resurrection, that power that turns governments upside down, that, that corrects the nature and the error of, of human civilization. That's what they were being persecuted for because they not only practice it, they clung to it, they preached it, uh, they promoted it to the point that it was changing the world and it will change the world today. And there will be a cost for that going forward as we get closer and closer to the end. And again, I ask you what's in the name Praise God, Matthew 18 and 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He's not talking about just anybody that decides to get together and have a Bible study. That That's, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a, a grand thing, a grand endeavor to be involved in. But there needs to be a commitment there. It needs to be individuals that understand what they're doing, at least one of them. Um, because today we've got a world that's full of people that use the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus, who have absolutely no idea who he even is, what he even is, what he wants from them, how he intends for them to live. They go about making up uh, their own rules, interpreting the Bible to their own liking as if it was written by uh, Western Gentile uh, apostles, and it, and it certainly wasn't. So there is a, 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 a an underlying understanding or statement that these people have to come together with understanding and for his purpose, his intent, his desire, not ours, not human ambition, all right? Matthew 19 and 29, and everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my name's sake, you begin to do what that Bible actually tells you to do. And you will find your Christian family, your Christian wife, your Christian husband often, your Christian relatives, your Christian friends departing from you, applying labels to you, all because you're doing things the way he said to do them, all because you are obeying instructions that he taught as being absolutely critical. It's all bound up in the name, but because you follow after that name and everything that it uh, means it begins to cost you. For my namesake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. I honestly believe he's talking about the spoils of a spiritual war. At the end of all this, when all things are resolved, uh, we shall be repaid for your effort, not out of a sense of obligation, and you shouldn't see it that way. It simply comes because you have dedicated your life and poured it out uh, in ministry to other people on his behalf. All right. Matthew 21 and 9. And the multitudes that were that went before and that followed Christ saying, Hosanna, for the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In this instance, you've got the crowd calling these things out to Yeshua saying, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're talking about Yehovah, okay? Yeshua is the open declaration of the nature and the character of the creator of the universe. He is indeed that creator incarnate, but he is the open declaration. No one had seen anything like this since the days of Adam when God walked in the uh, garden the cool of the evening. All right. But what's in the name? Matthew 23 and 39. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew 24 and 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What's in the name? In this instance, if you look at the original language, 
the men that come are not claiming that they themselves are Messiah. They are claiming that Yeshua is Messiah. They start off with that good foundation and then they begin to deceive people from that point. They agree, yes, indeed, Yeshua is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. And then they go on to teach things he did not teach and were counter to what he taught, all using his name. Praise God. Matthew 24 and 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Because there's power in that name to turn governments upside down, to turn nations upside down, to turn neighborhoods upside down, to turn families upside down. When you begin to speak the name Yeshua and those things that he taught, everything encapsulated in that name, is 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 a catalyst for change it's going to cause change when used properly and again i ask you what's in the name praise god john 17 and 6 yeshua speaking i have manifested thy name i have manifested thy name i have made known the character of the living god Okay, unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. The word of God is in the name of Yeshua and all he did and taught. When you use that name, there's an entire library uh, of, of, of power and, and understanding, compassion, and sometimes even vengeance behind it. All right. John 20 and 31. But these but these were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name, his renown, those things taught about him, those things instructed about him. It's not enough just to believe. It's not just enough to ask Jesus into your heart. It's not enough just accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's not enough to make a mental ascension to these things, to agree and to move on. It has to change your life. If it's not changing your life, if you've got the wrong Jesus. You've got the wrong name. You don't understand who or what he is. I started to say was, but really it's is because he's not passed away. He's as relevant right now as he ever has been to them that will call on him and obey. All right. Verse 21 of Acts, Acts 20, no, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. To call on the name of the Lord is not a one-time occasion. It is not a single act of repentance. It means to repeatedly call on that name. It means to worship him, to celebrate your victories, to bring him your problems, your difficulties, your struggles, to share the struggle that he still has in the world of bringing truth to men and women. It's really about worship not the enunciation um, of the name one time at a point of repentance, genuine or not. Um, it's to call on God, the creator of all things, continually through the manifested presence of that God in the person of Yeshua, Messiah. Acts 2 and 38, then, said, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's where the authority rests. It does not rest in titles of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or any other individual um, that may have claimed to be Messiah. The power, the authority is in the name of Yeshua. I don't make an argument over the use of the name uh, Jesus, not as of yet. That may be a problem in the near future, but we'll have to wait and see. But the fact remains, the power is in the name. The spiritual realm recognizes that. 
the demonic realm recognizes that if you're authorized to use it. All right. Acts 3 and 6, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Because the power to heal, the power to correct everything that sin has ever done. And I'm not saying the individual was lame because of sin in their life. I'm saying the individual is lame because of sin that entered into humanity and into our DNA and began to corrupt things um, and, and cause many, many troubles in the physical body. Also consider the fact that this is the first time we see it written in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why the addition of the word Nazareth? Nazareth is a village some 80 kilometers north of Jerusalem. The descendants of King David, among whom Yeshua is, live there for their own protection. Every king, every Roman puppet, um, Greek puppet, that ever came into to power in that area really had a, a fear that out of this family would eventually come um, one who would take down their power, their leadership, their kingdom, and, and rule in their stead because prophecy has said that it will, will occur, and it will occur. So he's not just that, it's, it's it, these people are called Nitzarim, the plural, dwellers of Nazareth, um, the household of the king. That's what they're beginning to put forward here. They're beginning to uh, in, in, announce the fact that he's not only Messiah. He's not only the, the Melech Zadik, the priest. He's also the king. That's how far the, the authority extends both into both realms. Acts 3 and 16, and his name, and in his name, sorry, I apologize, and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and ye and know, yea, the faith which is, which is by him hath given him his perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So the apostles have been called in um, about the question of this healing of this man, Acts 4 and 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what name have ye done this? They're questioning him because of the healing of the lame man, which stirred up the crowd to the point that it had to be dealt with. It was public knowledge, all right? Acts 4 and 10, be it known unto all you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, you know, the Netzarim, priest and king. What's in a name? Quite a bit. Whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. Because the atoning blood of Yeshua made many things possible that were not before. It opened many spiritual doors. It opened up the prison house, literally, to them that would come out. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. There's no salvation. There's one source. There's one way. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not titles, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Not Buddha. Not Caesar. But the name of Yeshua, literally interpreted salvation, is the only name by which you can be saved. All right. Acts 14 and 17, the uh, council there answering the apostles. It had been discussed, what shall we do? And they came to the agreement that many have risen up in times past claiming to be Messiah, and they all have fallen away and been forgotten about. However, if this is not the case, and this indeed is of God, you cannot fight against it. So let us wait and see. That's what was said before this verse. And they called them, sorry, Acts 14, 
and Acts 4 and 17. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. The proclamation of the name of Yeshua and those things he did and taught. He's talking about repentance, water baptism with the invocation of the name, the keeping of the Saturday Sabbath, which he spoke of every time he walked into a synagogue, the keeping of the Moedim, Leviticus chapter 3, 23, verses 1 to 23, which outlined everything that would happen from the Passover on which he was crucified until the ascension after the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, in the same year. All those things are encapsulated in that name. What's in the name? Acts 14 and 18, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. Acts 4 and 30, but stretching forth thine hand to heal, the, 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 the apostles are, are preaching and thanking God, but by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. When you go back to the Greek and look at those three words, we know what Jesus is. We know what Yeshua is, salvation. That holy child speaks of an individual like no other individual separated out of humanity because he was a human being. God became, he, did, he was not God in a people suit. He literally took on the economy of humanity. He was as human as you and I are, but born for a specific purpose, to come into the world to atone for sin, unique. And all of that is in the name. Every time you speak it, that's why hell shudders. They understand these things that most Christians do not. All right. Acts 5 and 28 saying, and they had gone on, the apostles had gone on to preach even after being threatened. And this is the answer. They hauled them back in to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Observed, tried, inspected, uh, investigated once again. Um, and, and this is the answer of that situation, saying, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. His blood was already upon them. They were guilty of shedding innocent blood. They were already committed to judgment. The only way out of it would have been for them to repent and join the fray of the faithful. Some did, many did not. And God will reckon their end. Acts 5 and 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to be, ought to obey God rather than men. In Acts 5 and 40, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, because they, this is the point at which they said they're going to let this go and see what happens. After they called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. I really wonder how many people would continue to preach the name if they had been called in twice, beaten, scourged, you know, threatened with death, and told to stop preaching that stuff in this town? in this neighborhood i wonder how many people would i wonder what i would do i pray to god that he would give me the courage and the strength to continue doing what needs to be done even if it costs me my life because it's worth it his name is worth it his renown is worth it what he potentially would do in the lives of people who surrender themselves to him is worth it the change he's going to bring about in this world is worth it there's a new heaven and a new earth coming, friend. And it's all through the name of Yeshua. What's in the name? Verse Acts 5, 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, having freshly been beaten, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. 
the night that he was crucified, they all pretty much scattered to the wind. And now they're rejoicing because they can share in his suffering, as it were, and, in, and to some degree undo the failure of that night that he was taken and crucified the, the next day. Not that you could ever repay him for what he's done and is doing in your life. But there is no greater honor to than to, to, to be to suffer for his name and even to give your life for it. That is the highest elevation possible. When you were so much like Yeshua that he wanted to kill you too. Praise God. Acts 19. This is the verse where Yeshua sends an Ananias to go and pray for all that he might receive his sight. And it reads, and then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things of this man, how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. And as a side note, just exactly how much power and authority did these Jewish or, or uh, well, they were Jewish, of other tribe of Judah, how much power do they have in, in these foreign cities, these foreign capitals? What kind of relationship is going on there where they, they've got the uh, power, the authority to, to operate like that outside their own nation? Just a question. But the Lord, this is nine, Acts 9 and 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You, if you're listening to this, more likely than not, are a chosen vessel as well. Perhaps not to the degree that Paul was, but you were a chosen vessel, chosen to bear his name, to demonstrate what God is in the person of Yeshua in the earth. It is your privilege to take up your cross and follow him in demonstrating his personality, um, his law in the earth, in the face of other human beings, to make him known through your own life, through his living through you. All right. Acts 9, 16, for I show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. For all that I am, for all that my name encompasses, I'm going to demonstrate these things. And I'm going to allow him to demonstrate those things. And it will eventually cost him his life, even as it cost me mine. And so it did. All died for the cause. And today we have problems getting people to live for the cause. Praise God. Acts 9 and 21, but all that heard him were amazed and said, is not he that, this is not this he that destroyed them was called on this name at Jerusalem, speaking of Paul. The call on the name is worship. Again, the call on the name is not a one-time event. It is a lifestyle of worship and uh, pursuit of the knowledge and the presence of God and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. Acts 15 and 14, Simon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. That's what you are. I mean, there are old songs written about it, a uh, trophy of grace, but that's really what it is. You are going to be uh, the icon or one among many of the goodness of God into eternity. To show forth the mercy and the glory and the power, the love, the kindness of the living God and that he was willing to do all that he did to save you and I, despite the fact that uh, we did not deserve it, never came to deserve it, 
never will come to deserve it. But he continued to work and to sacrifice in our lives to bring us to the point that we understood and fell in love with who and what he is. And all of that is in the name. Praise God. It is important that some out there somewhere that, that somebody understand there is so much bound up in that name. There is so much absolute power and authority in it. It is not like any name ever named. Hell must bow. Men will answer. Amen. Acts 15 and 16, after this, this is uh, Jehovah speaking, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, that's Jehovah, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. The name has been placed upon them. It becomes a family name. All that come to him bear that name. We are all part of the household of God, individual members, but all bearing the same name of Yeshua. It is written in us. Praise God. Upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. This is the book of Romans 9 and 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show forth my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Every struggle you face, every challenge you come to, is a potential for the demonstration of the goodness and the mercy of God. If we can ever learn to see adversity in that light, it changes everything. He's going to go through the drama. He's going to let it build to a hypertensive state so that he can step in at the point of absolute disbelief by almost everyone involved and show that indeed there is a living God in this earth. People suffering with cancer often go into depression. You know, uh, have great difficulty dealing with it. I can understand that. But if you are a believer in Messiah, if you understand who and what he is, and you are living as you should, cancer does not hold an end for you. Let's suppose you actually died of your cancer. If your relationship is as it should be, you're going to wake up looking into the face of God. But many times in this world, friend, I have heard the reports from people I trust are not liars. That doctors have preparing for surgery, have gone in, checked the x-rays one more time, and discovered that cancer is no longer there. That at the answer of prayer, it had to flee. It's not an unknown circumstance. It happens. Why? For his glory. So that a doctor, a nurse, some relative who thinks cancer is a God can see that cancer is no God. And there are a thousand other circumstances like this that could be noted. All right. Hebrews 6 and 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name. I'm so caught up in this. I've seen so much. I, I'm so enamored with the depth and the breadth and the love of the living God that I'm willing to use the whole of my life for the furtherance of that cause of that king of, of that kingdom and the elevation of that name to everyone until everyone knows it and understands it praise god Hebrews 13 and 15 by him therefore let us 
offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Yeshua is the object of worship for the believer. Yeshua is Jehovah God incarnate. We often think of, of the God of eternity as being far off and distant. But in the person of Yeshua, he has made himself up close and personal. So personal, in fact, that he will walk with you as an individual. The God of the universe will walk with you as an individual. That is his desire. Praise God. First Peter 4 and 14, if you have, I'm sorry, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and God resteth upon you. And their part, he is on their part, he is evil spoken, but on your part, he is glorified. Persecution brings the presence of the living God in a way you will never experience outside of persecution because he comes to comfort, to guide, and instruct his own through those things. He does not leave you to, to pull it all off yourself. He doesn't even expect that. The Bible says that he told the apostles, don't even think about what you're going to say when you're questioned. I'll fill your mouth in that hour. I will fill your mouth in that hour. And all of that is in the name. Praise God. Revelation 2 and 17, and we're about to end here. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. At the resurrection, you yourself receive a new name from Yeshua, whose name we name and worship and proclaim to all that we can. This has been a brief uh number of verses here i didn't I, I didn't use half of those that i could have for the sake of uh brevity and for understanding you give people too much information and sometimes you lose the benefit of it by overloading them all these things are in the name when you speak the name all of heaven moves. All of the authority of the kingdom of God moves. All of it is focused on what you're doing. You need that revelation. You need to understand you're not just one lonely little soul trying to pray somebody's headache away. No, friend, if you have obeyed the gospel, I mean the real gospel, the Acts 238 gospel, if you are keeping the commandments, if you are keeping the Saturday Sabbath, if you are keeping the high Sabbath, if you are doing everything you can to be obedient to what is in that book and not making excuses for it, you have the power, you have the authority to use that name. There's healing in that name. There's deliverance in that name. I pray right now in the name of Yeshua, for a spirit of revelation to touch every man and woman hearing this today, tomorrow, and as long as this remains available. Open our mind, God, and cause us to see that we're not ragtag uh, little people of no consequence in this world. We are ambassadors of a great king and a great kingdom and awesome power. We simply need to learn how to wield it, when to use it, when to refrain from using it. But the name is always effective. The name is always powerful. The, the effect of it may be immediate. It may be months or years down the road. But it never goes forth forward. It will always accomplish what it was sent forth to do. Speak the name over everything. All you need, all you hope for, all those that you love, 
In the name of Yeshua, I pray God seal these words to our minds. I appreciate you for having taken the time out of your day, out of your Sabbath, uh, to join me for this recorded broadcast. Um, and we will see you next Sabbath for a resumption of our study in the book of Daniel, uh, our little uh, foray into es eschatology. All right. In the name of Yeshua, amen and amen.